O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The New York Times ran a curious photograph. There's the photograph. It was on the front page of the New York Times. It's a photo of a six-year-old boy in Africa. He's bailing out a boat, as you can see, a small fishing boat. Now, are any of you disturbed by the picture? Not really. But there was a caption beneath the original picture that explained that the boy was an indentured servant, leased for years from the boy's parents by the fisherman in the back of the boat. The story becomes more disturbing when you learn that the boy's task is bailing out the boat as much as 14 hours every day. Because the man who owns the boat is so poor, he cannot afford to repair his boat. And yet he's just prosperous enough to own a little boy to keep it from sinking. The boy's parents are so poor that they had to indenture him to the fisherman for a little bit of money. The existence of a child enslaved by a poor fisherman is nearly too dark to comprehend. If he did not bail, he was beaten. If he bailed, the water still filled the boat. His life was, well, he didn't have a life, did he? Now, the New York Times is not caught printing the same photograph more than once, but an exception. A little over six months after the photo first ran, readers were curious, even shocked, to open their papers and to see the same photo again. Why? What could warrant such poor journalism? The story connected with the second publication of The Boy in the Boat was related, and yet very different. The new story told a tale of a couple in tiny Neosho, Missouri, Pam and Randy Cope, whose 15-year-old son, Jansen, a high school freshman baseball lover, had died suddenly of a heart condition just a few months before. Pam was a hairdresser, and Randy was a vice president in a company that owned some small new newspapers across several states. At the time of their son's death, they had received about $25,000 in contributions to a charitable fund in Jansen's memory that they asked to have set up in lieu of flowers. The Cope's world before their son died consisted of baseball games, dance lessons for their daughter, and trips to places like Disney World. It was a small world, the mother says. She says, I was pretty shallow. Well, it took the couple a year to find a new focus. They thought of buying new uniforms for the girls' soccer team in town, but they learned that there was already enough money for that. Perhaps some new playground equipment for the parks, but that wasn't a crying need either. Pam said it got almost comical as doors were continually closed to their memorial gifts. But then, some friends who were working on building orphanages in Vietnam invited them to go over for a visit. And that's when their world changed completely and the darkness was banished. And now they work to rescue children from human trafficking and slavery, to care for children in shelters. Oh, yes, and they saw the picture of six-year-old Mark Quadwo in the New York Times bailing out the boat and found a way to help him and others like him. And that's why the picture was published twice on the front page. 
Jesus said, believe me, believe me, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. Not only did new life, true life, come to the children who were helped by the Copes Foundation, wondrous as it is, but the Copes, too, found light in their darkness, life that springs up to eternal life through their faith, working. Indicative of their new life, Pam Cope was transformed from being a hairdresser in a tiny village in Missouri to a fundraiser for buying children from slavery and situating them in safety. For her, the speaking was very stressful at first. She'd address four or five hundred people and not one single one would give. And then she says that she decided that she'd be a voice not for the organization, but only a voice for children in crisis, not trying to control the reactions of the listeners. Close to the time of the second appearance of that picture, of the boy bailing the boat on Lake Volta in Ghana, Mrs. Cope arranged for the buyout of seven children at the bargain basement price of just $3,600 per child, which included payments for new nets, boat repairs, and other needs for the fishermen, and written agreements with the parents that their children should be cared for henceforth at a Christian-run orphanage called the Village of Hope. Nightlife. True life. Found in the darkness of night, just like Nicodemus found night life. Rebirth. Birth from above. Now, I'll confess a sermon titled, Nightlife, may have tricked you. We might be rather suspicious that any God-given true life can be found covered up by darkness. We'd be wrong. In the Bible itself, many fascinating and important things happen by night. In the encounter between Nicodemus and Jesus, what begins by night with great intrigue ends with revelations of new life. Did I set you up? Yes, I did. I meant to. Nightlife connotes different things to each of us. Earthly pleasures, glittering but brief delight, strange new worlds, shame, but seldom what we learn Nicodemus found. That Nicodemus would come to Jesus under the cover of dark could have been for various reasons. He was a learned man and a phenomenally powerful one, belonging to the organization that's called the Sanhedrin, which was a circle of just 70 men who governed Jewish life in Jerusalem under the high priests. His reputation was at risk. He hid. Now, in ancient times, everything stopped at sunset, but... Study of the scriptures did not stop. It went on into the night. And so for Nicodemus, nightlife meant learning more about the scriptures. And yet, having known about Jesus, it meant even more than that. Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who is sent by God. Jesus moves to his own point as if the night were short. I assure you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus saw depth in Jesus. But by night, Nicodemus found the well, not just the bucket and the rope. He found eternal life. He found the water springing up to new life out of darkness. Nicodemus also took a risk to venture into the night to meet Jesus. Personally, I wish that all of us felt the kind of risk 
and potential for major upheaval in our lives that occurs when we go seek Jesus and his words. The potential loss of old relationships and the potential discovery of new and challenging ones. Jesus, by this time, was already being challenged by the authorities. And though some sources indicate that Nicodemus might have been one who was sent to entrap him, most other sources do not agree with that viewpoint. In the sermonette that Jesus delivers through John's pen, many decades after the original events occurred, he moves further afield from speaking to Nicodemus alone, and he addresses the wider church. He indicates his saving death when he speaks of being lifted up like the serpent of Moses. This saving death of Jesus was the core text of St. Paul in his later writings. But for John, the gospel writer, the subject of the full life in the Spirit is what Jesus gave. For Paul, flesh was equated with sin. But that is not so for John. According to the late Raymond Brown, the great Roman Catholic scholar of the New Testament. According to Brown, flesh in John means only weakness and finitude, mortality, which conditions are overcome in the present by faith in Jesus, which faith is a purely, purely a gift from God, a gift from above, a new birth, John, the gospel teller, uses the opportunity also to speak sacramentally of water of new life, which the early church definitely understood to point to the water of baptism. There's life then for Nicodemus that came from his surreptitious foray into the darkness, even though he could not quite fathom what gift of being born again from above meant. Born in the spirit, what did it mean? we do well to wonder at the mystery ourselves and not to define it too closely. Eternal life, zoein eonion, was the night life that Nicodemus found. We know he found it because we know that against the risk of his reputation, he later ministered to Jesus and his mother during and after the crucifixion. Nicodemus became an undertaker, wrapping the body for burial in haste as the Sabbath was drawing close. Now this was a huge departure from Jewish custom in which no Pharisee would ever touch a dead body. But don't we see? Nicodemus had found life. A life that transcended the present. A life that transcended death and the old ways of living. Diana Butler Bass wrote Christianity for the rest of us. And there she says, mainline renewal is not rocket science. You preach the gospel, offer hospitality, and pay attention to people's worship and spiritual lives. Frankly, you take Christianity seriously as a way of life. Now, many people are completely disinterested in religious institutions today. But the appeal of living spiritual communities is rising. It's very significant, especially among younger people. I think there's too much of the identity of churches that is tied to their size and their prominence, not just their worthy Christian commitments. But when the prominence of our long-held identity is significantly eroded, churches begin to focus on survival as much as new life. Struggles for survival produce grief, anxiety, and confusion. 
Now it's true, those words grief, anxiety, and confusion are, by the way, perfect words for the season of Lent. But sometimes divisive issues get addressed as they should and must, but they get addressed under the stress of survival and they receive more emotion than they would have if other stressors had not existed, which can weaken the church's financial and numerical support even further. Now, don't think I'm singling out this congregation alone. The issue is the same in a thousand Presbyterian churches in America and thousands and thousands of other churches. Issues, ministries such as ministry with HIV AIDS or with the homeless are demanded and they get attention and they've gotten attention. But in the long run, sometimes the conflict around issues like that gets vented by squabbles around what color to paint the parlor. Or whether to cut down that old tree that's blocking the public view of the church and so forth. We have such issues in our congregation. New life in the love of Jesus Christ in the face of these kinds of things gets pushed to the sidelines. In Christianity for the rest of us, how the neighborhood church is transforming the faith, Bass found that Christians are forming a different sort of village in congregations across the country that are not spiritual gated communities. New kind of Christianity, she writes, which is actually an old kind of Christianity, a kind that Jesus was bent on sharing with Nicodemus by night, serves us as a living guide when we are spiritual nomads seeking to find wisdom and life. Perhaps part of our Lenten discipline and spiritual journey together may be to find night life and to find it the way Nicodemus found it. If it's true that God loved the world enough to give his son that whoever believes in him might not die but have and know eternal life. Good God, we pray, give us that life. Amen.